Um, and let me just go through the note well. So I'm looking at the list. Most everybody has been here so and participated in the ITF. So I'm presuming you're well aware of um, our note well and IETF policies with respect to participation. Um, with that, with the agenda, I wanted to take five minutes to do the bashing and to remind everyone that we are um, recording the session. There is a Jabber room. Um, given that we do have a Jabber room, is there anybody that's willing to help us monitor that and channel whoever's in the Jabber room if they have questions? Anyone? Nancy, uh, I'm I am logged into the Jabber room, so if if there's okay. if someone asks something and it's not answered, I will I'll try okay. and keep an eye on it. Okay. Um, and given that we do get into discussions, I thought I would ask if um, I think it worked really well during the virtual sessions last week where we had a running queue. Um, for those who may not be familiar what happened last week was anybody who wanted to speak um, during each of the presentations mm -hmm. would rather than speaking um, would put themselves in the queue in the chat room by doing a plus queue if they didn't want to be in the queue or be removed from the queue they would put a minus p um, <laughs> So Nancy, it might be useful to clarify, it's the WebEx chat room. Thank you. <laughs> it is the WebEx chat room. Thank you for that, Roman. So if I'm not hearing disagreement, um, thank you. So if you wanna ask a question um, or make a comment, please put yourself on the queue Ned, Kathleen is not going to be able to join us today. Are, do you mind running the queue? I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Okay, so with that, um, we have uh, in the agenda today, we've got um, Michael to give us an update on the architecture draft, um, Lawrence on the EAT, um, Plain characteristics. Lawrence, in the discussion here, I wanted to find out um, when you think you can put an update um, to the draft, because I noticed the last update was done in February. Um, then Eric will talk about the timing definitions that's being discussed in the architecture, followed with Lawrence's discussion also on, on the timestamps. Followed by a new draft that was posted by Eric on trusted path routing and then Wei Pang on the pub sub. Um, and Nancy, uh, before we jump into this, can we see if we can get a second uh, Etherpad note taper? I was just about to say, <laughs> we, <laughs> we, we uh, need a- I will help after I talk. Thanks, Michael. And then anybody, um, who's overlooking the etherpad, please feel free to also help and annotate um, with that. The other process that we're following is, um, please look at the etherpad. We're running the blue sheets in the etherpad, so add your name there um, to make sure that we capture everybody who's participating. Any comments or issues on the agenda? Okay, here we go. Let's go ahead and get started. So, Michael, I have your architecture slides here. Why did it not go to the beginning? Okay, so are you going to exchange Eric and Lawrence? Are you? I thought I did. So, Lawrence is going to talk about the claims first. Then Eric is going to talk about the timing. Did you want me to change the order? That was, is that what you, is that? I'm sorry. Yes. Is that what that's that was the correct order? Yes. Looks good to me. Yes. All right. Thought that was the wrong order. 
Now, this was the requested order. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm ready to start. Okay. I'm trying to figure out why it's not going to the beginning. There we go. Push up arrow. Okay. Um, great. My screen copy. Okay. So, and maybe Excuse people me? could be on mute. Patrick, maybe that was. Um, hi, um, this is Michael Richardson. So um, there has been a approximately weekly or more often design team meeting for the architecture draft. Um, and we have mostly met on Tuesday mornings at 10 a.m. EST uh, with a couple other Fridays and had some other ad hoc meetings that were added to get work finished. Um, that list alphabetically is my, I hope, collection of everyone that I've seen show up. Uh, stars next to those who are authors, and we added Wei Pan as an author in early February. Next slide, please. So I'm going to go through um, the uh, walk through the architecture, um, talk a little bit about the table contents, the open issues, um, which is of course changing. It's changed since I made the slide. Uh, and basically the, what we've done since last meeting and what it looks like. Next slide, please. Um, and I'd be very happy to take questions as we go. Um, but I have left a, a chunk of time at the end to, uh, deal with questions of a more general nature. So this is the table contents as it looks now. You can see we have added, um, six major use cases. Um, we've had conversations about adding more, uh, but at this point, we think that this pretty much covers uh, the high level of pretty much all of the, the situations. Um, we still think that um, there are details um, of this, and one of the things um, I believe Ned and some other people have suggested different terms, one of them is protocol. And we, when you describe a particular use case and how it's used, that it's actually a particular protocol because there's a conveyance and a whole bunch of other things that are involved and the architecture doesn't deal with that. Um, so um, number nine, freshness is uh, subject of a discussion with uh, Lawrence and Eric. This is what's become timing um, and how do we measure freshness? So I'm not gonna delve into that a great deal in that part. Um, and I don't think there should, there'll be a major change in in the table contents as we go forward. But uh, um, if there is uh, some particular um, uh, thing that you want to discuss in there about, archi about the overview of the architecture, the architecture of the architecture, that would be a reasonable question. Next slide. Next slide. So, uh, no, sorry, go back one. This is slide four. Okay, thank you. Just there's a delay. Um, so uh, th these are some links to uh, the open issues, at least as of uh, Friday morning-ish. Um, there have been some, I think one or two closed since and one or two open. Um, in general, we try to collect uh, concerns that we may have um, as issues, which we then ha wind up having pull requests to change the text, or sometimes it's just a pull request, here's some text. Um, anyone is welcome to comment, to review, and uh, we'd be very much interested in what's going on. You can see the numbers are up in the 60s. We've closed quite a number of issues as we've gone forward. Um, and there's maybe one or two issues that uh, we will perhaps uh, never agree on, and there may be there are some issues that, you know, should we have a claims uh, terminology, which is almost a bite shed. Next slide. Since last time, you may have seen the slide from before, we have uh, extensively uh, uh, argued and created an introduction. Um, we've reworked the tech terminology discussion and it's pretty much done. Uh, we realized that the word claim was not in it. Um, and then wondered whether we needed to define it. And we actually did some research in other RFCs that do define the word claim, thinking none of them actually de 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 
None of them actually defined it, but that was not the case. Um, <clears throat> published 02 just before, uh, well, I guess it was published with the, um, uh, published as a deadline, which then became not a deadline. Um, and uh, we will publish another one soon. Next slide. So conceptually, um, we drew this um, three box, a tester, verifier, and relying party flow. This is generically what happens. There's evidence that moves from the attester to the verifier, and there's attestation results that move to the relying party. Um, and then having written that flow, we realized that there was a bunch of things we needed that also were important that we needed to define, which is the endorsements from the endorser, an appraisal policy, and an appraisal policy for the attestation results for the relying party. So those are in the blue, pink, and purple boxes if you're not colorblind. And the important thing to realize is that these are none of these are currently in the charter for the current IETF RATS working group. It's possible um, that they are not in they will never be in scope for the charter, or it's possible they will get the working group will get rechartered to include one of the, or more of these items. But at present um, these are external things, and uh, while we can discuss the properties, um, we're not talking about how to standardize those. The um, way specifically that the attester verifying relying party operate um, and the things that they emit being evidence and attestation results are directly within the RATS uh, charter, um, and the architecture speaks about the properties and the activities of each. Next slide, please. So we realize there's two types of environments. There's a target environment, which is the thing that we are trying to say something about. And there's the testing environment, which is the thing that does the um, evaluation or the measurement. Next slide, please. Someone's got a lot of static coming in. Patrick, maybe you could mute, because that's what's Telling me, or someone could mute Patrick. You, I, you, either. Thank you. I'm on it. He's muted. Yeah. Um, so the target environment. We have had some interesting conversations where some people said there are some use cases where the target environment and the attesting environment are the same thing, and in fact, that that the suggestion is that there's some cases where it will measure itself. Next slide. So. Some people ask the question, can any object be trusted properly to measure itself? Um, can those measurements be trusted if you are doing that self? Next slide. And so we have agreed to the statement that, um, yes, this is possible for them to be in a single environment, but it's up to the verifier to decide if this makes sense. Um, and so while there's a lot of environments where this would be an untrustworthy kind of thing, ultimately the verifier is what decides this. Right. Next slide. So there's a question. Oh, keep going. One. You went one too far. There was one more bubble. That's okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, register yourself in the queue and we know. Um, so um, we have this concept called layered attestation. And none of you are familiar with this in the form of trusted boot, where there is a, a one piece of code which runs, uh, which measures the next piece of code, provides evidence for it, and this goes on. And we've illustrated three layers in this case. Next slide, please. And so, for instance, the first layer is often the UEFI BIOS firmware. Next slide, please. The next environment is often some rich execution environment, as the, the T people call it, you know, some operating system, something else, some kernel and pieces like that. Next slide, please. And an example of a third layer is maybe there's some applica target applications that are measured or a configuration or set of processes. These layers are not strict. It's, you could have two or seven that's irrelevant to the thing and you can throw them in different ways. These are just examples of some things. 
Um, and finally, the next slide. We, we, we repeated this UAFI BIOS firmware. We think it's a mouthful and we would love to have a better term, uh, which is inclusive, um, representative and less of a mouthful if someone has a brilliant idea. Next slide. Along the way, we have come across the, and defined the concept of a composite device. Um, a composite device contains uh, a lead, a tester, uh, which is the term that we decided to, we settled on in the end. And the lead, a tester is the, the environment which has a connection to the verifier um, and is going to accept um, evidence uh, from other attesters, B and C, which could be, for instance, line cards and a chassis. Uh, they could be, you might have an aggregate of essentially identical systems, but one of which is elected as the, uh, as the master. So similar chassis concept, but maybe in separate physical boxes. Um, the example of a smartphone where there's a main CPU and a broadband CPU, which um, doesn't have internet connectivity and therefore doesn't do the attesting. Um, and other devices where there's some devices attached to a system bus of some kind that, uh, where not all devices have external connectivity. Um, in, in particular, one thing I'll note, and we spent a long time talking about, um, it's entirely possible that a tester B or C provides its evidence to lead a tester A, who then goes to verifier B and takes an attest, an attest, an attestation results back acts as the relying party and provides that as part of its evidence to its verifier A. Um, and while we have some text that explains a little bit of that, um, and it's a third dimension to this diagram, um, that this is not, this is, doesn't really change the architecture in any way. It just changes the nature of exactly what is evidence. Um, and, and that's fine. Um, what matters in this context is that, <clears throat> um, we may have to deal with the fact that we have evidence of composite devices and this evidence may be, uh, may be signed in different ways by different things, by different um, uh, uh, testers. And um, that's the critical part about the thing. Next slide. So you've heard about the topology models. We talked about them way back in the, the first IETF. Uh, we came up with this concept of passport and background models, background check model. Um, someone does animation. I would sure love to have a, an animation where the top diagram mutates into the left diagram or the right diagram. That would be very pretty and very instructive. The, the important thing is that logically the evidence always goes from the attester to the verifier. And you can see on the bottom left, that is the case. It goes directly from there. But the attestation results comes back through the attest, uh, attester and then goes to relying party. That attester, while well, he could audit or possibly even look at them, that results essentially is not contributing to them in any significant way. It passes them on through a different uh, another conveyance. Similarly, in the background check model, the attester passes his evidence to the relying party, which more or less passes it directly to the verifier without changing it. We have discussions about whether there could be additional signatures or other uh, session layer conveyance issues between the relying party and the verifier. And that's entirely possible, but fundamentally there's a signed artifact that goes from the attester to the verifier, and that's the thing called evidence. In the, in the background check model, of course, the attestation results come back directly, and people have described also degenerate cases where the verifier is part of the relying party, in which case there's no conveyance, no, no protocol, it's all internal. Um, but from a role point of view, uh, we see the three pieces. And, um, Three colors for colorblind people. Next slide. So a critical part of what we're doing here is to get interoperability between different devices. And ultimately, uh, interoperability requires that the format of the evidence and the format of the attestation results um, is understood. Um, and in general, we believe that attesters, particularly constraint ones, will produce a single format of, 
of evidence or a single device will running a particular firmware will produce a single evidence. Um, and that the verifier will have to accept some set of evidence from uh, devices that are compatible with it. And we're not saying uh, which uh, type of evidence is required, although there is a strong uh, uh, feeling that CWT and JWT should be used for anybody who doesn't have some legacy or other uh, um, uh, format that they have to be compatible with. Similarly, the relying party is probably going to accept only a single kind of evidence, and it's quite likely the relying party is going to, to determine um, what format that is, and the verifier will have to adapt to it. Um, now, of course, this is subject to many, many things, and we had a lot of conversation as to whether or not the evidence, there's any negotiation of what kind of evidence is used. And I think we have agreement that, yes, it's entirely possible that uh, conveyance protocols could negotiate what kind of uh, what kind of attestation results or even what kind of evidence will be communicated, but that specification of such a negotiation protocol or agreement protocol is not within the scope of the architecture to do, um, and it would be strictly within the the use case or protocol of, of applicability to do such a thing. That in most cases it's going to be the protocol document which specifies what the format of the formats are and that this is entirely appropriate. Appropriate. We expect that there will be verifiers that can deal with multiple relying parties, providing some commonality, and therefore may have to speak with different kinds of evidence, uh, excuse me, different formats. And they will likely speak to a variety of different uh, kinds of attesters, different uh, uh, products, different kinds of products, different um, revisions of those products. They may move from X509 in an old version and or some TPM TCG based thing to CWT in a future version. And so even though the model may not change, the firmware could change and the verifier therefore may be accepting evidence in multiple different kinds of formats. But in general, the thing to emphasize is that the evidence of a particular uh, uh, flow for a particular device is in one format and the attestation results come out in one format. There's no requirement that uh, the results be produced in multiple formats at the same time. Next slide, please. That's really it. Questions? Our next meeting, I think, will be next Tuesday, unless someone's noted to cancel it. I think and Michael's, uh, it, we, have, we, have, we have, we have, we have, we have, we have canceled it because it would be opposite the Teak uh, meeting. So not next Tuesday, the one after. I'll give you back five minutes. Thank you. Just FYI, my chat is broken, but um, let me just remind everybody, there is a Jabber room running. Um, and for those who are attending and might have joined late, please add yourselves in as the virtual blue sheets in the etherpad. Okay, so next up, Lawrence. On the claims characteristics. Hello. Uh, so next slide, please. So there's the uh, PR out there. We I think we've discussed this briefly um, in Singapore um, or elsewhere, but um, going back about a year, uh, maybe even longer. There was a lot of discussion about how the different claims should be uh, formatted or created or reused or and a lot of people had a lot of opinions about that. Um, uh, so I put together some text that I think described, you know, some, some guidelines for creating claims. So there's uh, four of them here. Um, uh, you know, they should be. 
designed for interoperability. So, you know, one relying party can understand what they mean, you know, so that, that's a difficult goal because a lot of times uh, people want to do proprietary claims. Um, but there, there's value in getting a, a claim design that um, can be understood by multiple relying parties. Uh, there's uh, trying to be uh, neutral for the OS or the technology. So, you know, it's not about a particular operating system, uh, it's not particularly about uh, TEEs or TPMs or or JavaScript or mobile phones or so, so trying to be uh, neutral about, um, uh, you know, in in that way. Um, <clears throat> trying also to be neutral about security levels, so we're not just focused on on um, high security environments like TPMs and secure elements. We also uh, consider load security environments like user mode apps. Um, and another characteristic then was the want to try to reuse uh, extant data formats um, and, you know, not reinventing things. So, for example, we try to re reuse the, uh, the format for, for uh, GPS from uh, another uh, working group. Um, so, uh, and then I think uh, one go next to the next slide, please. Um, and there was one more, uh, yeah. So proprietary claims are okay, um, and then um, this whole notion of profiles, separate documents that um, say which claims are used in which use cases, uh, maybe prohibit some others, maybe narrow the def definition of existing claims. All that. So, um, trying to manage interoperability of claims. So, the the real question here and and is, um, where does this text go, and how does it kind of fit into the the fit into everything? So, um, we pr proposed. Um, well, so, so this, this text, you know, a lot of it could be uh, guidelines for IANA. Um, or uh, when, when uh, new claims are created. That kind of begs the question is, do they apply to uh, CWT and GWT? Um, so kind of, it's more of a, the, I think the question here is, is not so much about you know, agreement or disagreement about these characteristics, uh, at least so far there hasn't been too many objections to, or just much discussion about these characteristics. The discussion is where do they go? Um, so one, uh, you know, I've, I've proposed putting them in the eat document. Um, at first, they were just generic parts of the eat document. Now, um, I think they might be uh, IANA guidance. Um, but since we're sh we're sharing the uh, registry uh, with CWT, it seems like these should be. Uh, Applied to CWT in general, and and to me, most of these things would make uh, sense for CWT, not as requirements, but as guidelines. Lawrence, can you take a question? Sure. Yeah, this is good. Dave, there. You are. Yeah. Okay. My comment is on the previous slide. Um, the actually have uh, some. Uh, on your letter question, I think IANA considerations of the eat document for anything that is RET specific is great, and anything that is not RET specific is, is more for the uh, you know, CWT. That's to answer your question. But the reason I got in the queue was to say that there's I think there's another characteristic that would be good to um, add to the list, um, and I'm not sure how to label it. So let me just describe what I mean by it. it has to do with uh, uh, it, it occurred to me when you talked about don't reinvent. Uh, when you don't reinvent, exi you know, use existing structures and stuff. But it's also important to talk about when inventing claims to say, is it okay to reuse an existing claim or do I actually need to have a new claim for my own purpose? And so this might be, uh, this entails uh, one piece of that has to do with the fact that you can get a, uh, a name, such as if you're doing a proprietary extension, you can get a new name or something. That's the, the how, how do I generate the ID question. But the other part of it is, when is it appropriate to say, can I have a claim that can appear multiple times with the same name and the same claim set? 
or do I need to have different values for it? Or if I had different values for it, would I instead put a list of things inside the claim as opposed to having multiple occurrences of the claim? And so I think there needs to be something around claim design as to how do I design things that are multi-valued. Can you give an example? Uh, and one other piece of that before I give an example is um, uh, uh, also what happens if you have some proprietary things and some standards things, you know, do you don't mix the streams, you put those in separate claims or whatever. So let's say one example is in TEEP, we have a use case that says I need to pass in the claims, the set of uh, TAs that are installed, the set of applications that are installed. And elsewhere, uh, I need to pass a set of uh, applications that are requested to be installed but are not currently installed. Okay? And so uh, in each of those two cases, there's a list, right? And so we, uh, a uh, naive claim constructor would say, oh, well, if I have three applications that are installed, do I put those in three occurrences of the same claim in the same claim set? Or do I have a claim set that has uh, applications installed and inside it has a list inside that one claim? Uh, the other part of that is, let's say I have the list of, T list of applications installed and a list of applications that are meant to be installed or requested to be installed, but not currently installed. Do I put those into the same claims or are those two different claims? Because those are two semantic meanings, right? And so here I might say, um, as, as an example of a guidance to say, you know, don't mix those two, keep those two separate, but have the claim have a list rather than having claims have multiple occurrences. But the real point is the design consideration should bring this up and have some recommendations, regardless of whether you agree with my intuition or not. Yeah, okay. This is Hank, may I add, add to, the, to that? Uh, uh, sorry, uh, sorry. Hang on. Uh, Roman, Roman's next in the queue. Oh, sorry. Hi. I just wanted to return back to the, the question you had, Lawrence, about where do you put this text? I mean, I mean, some ideas is that if we're sharing the the, the same registries with CWT, we can't say anything that is let that is more permissive than what's in there because that'll create conflicts. And it occurs to me that the place if, if we want to talk about how claims should manifest in the RATS architecture, irrespective of how they're registered in the CWT, it seems like that should be covered in a profile document. Uh, so just to clarify, Roman, by profile document, you mean a separate document from the eat draft? I, I'm, and so I guess in my head, let me kind of think through this. I mean, the e draft enumerates what the claims would be. I saw in the slide after this one that we're displaying, we were talking about profiles. It would seem that at some point, we might want to talk about how they may manifest them, themselves in uh, in kind of the real in the real world and kind of in the rats architecture. I, I don't mean to presuppose where it goes. Maybe it's an appendix in the e trap. That would be weird, but it wouldn't surprise me if we ultimately published profiles that talk about specific collections of things in the CWT registry, and we can make make some statements there. So uh, I'm. Hey. I'm a little confused um, about your comment, Roman, because um, I mean, my thought would have, you know, one of the proposals was actually a revision of CWT to say, um, uh, re you know, revising the guidelines for uh, IANA for CWTs, because a lot of these characteristics, probably most of them, apply just fine to CWT. They're, they're not really rats specific. I mean, that's a, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have any disagreement with that option too. I mean, to me, that's consistent with us saying, since we share the registry with CWT, we need to be, we need to at least kind of share some behavior then, and we can't be, uh, I mean, we can't be, I guess, more permissive then, that's all. So H Hank and then Jim are in the queue. Hi, this is Hank. Sorry uh, for my breaking ticket before. Um, I think uh, if you're using CDDL and CWT in general, we are stuck with uh, uh, being uh, keys being unique, and therefore we would. Uh, uh, I think there's no decision because it's clear that we have multi-value here now, um, and I think that's fine because uh, semantically it's e easier to uh, um, possess. I assume. Also, uh, with specific to characteristics, that's I think that's a, a very Meta topic here is uh, how, how do we differentiate attestation results and evidence sets, even in subclaim sets, uh, from standard CWT? I think at the moment we cannot. 
we assume that they are reusable in CWT or defined CFN in EAT. So I have no hard understanding. Is this a common purpose CWT or is this actually really evidence? And you have to guess as you assume at the moment. Maybe, maybe we have to fix that. This is a comment. Yeah, I think we might have to. Yeah. So um, that's basically it. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, two things. Um, one, I actually read this the, the set of guidelines, and as a ACWT person, I did not think that they were necessarily appropriate for CWTs. Uh, I think that CWTs have very, very different guidelines that they should have. Um, the second thing is, I, I will say something that I said eons ago at a IETF meeting, and may have been, but not. I don't think I actually said it up in the room. My recommendation on how you register these claims is you register a rat's claim in the CWT registry. And then you go to town on your own sub registry with all the stuff you want to do because you can keep things, sh you can register things according to your own importance and not according to the importance of the CWT designated experts in that case. And it will also be obvious whether this is a rat's CWT or not in, in a lot of respects because if you have the rat's sub map, in your CWT claims, then it's a rat's register, or it's, it's a rat's acetation claim. Okay, no more questions in the queue. So I'm I'm not sure how to proceed at this point. Maybe I um. seems like ACE working group is not interested in picking this up. Um, and I guess I, or, or having, you know, modifications to CWT, at least based on Jim's comment. Um, well, I, I heard the guidance from Jim as to creating our own RAT registry, if you will these claims. And then from Roman, I heard that for the proprietary ones or for the flow that we could, um, not could, he was suggesting that we have separate documents, and I may be stating that more strongly, um, to describe them as profiles. Yeah, I mean, I think that's a conversation we should have. Yeah, I'm not suggesting we need those profiles. It's separating, registering the claims and describing the claims to me is different than, than describing what set of claims are required for a particular profile or use case, the way we're talking in Jabber. Hank is in the queue. Yeah, sorry, um, about, uh... Uh, and this is addressed to Jim and the group, of course, uh, how, where to register and registry. Um, we talked about a lot about having our separate registry and then we would have uh, a, a semantic impotent mismatch because we would define the same claims in two registries and we don't want to do that. That was a no. very fundamental decision I think we made and maybe Jim has some additional feedback about that. Um, because we were reusing all the good stuff that is already there without creating semantically, well, slightly different things with the same keys, but a different tag at the map, and oh, I don't know. So the, 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 the idea was to deliberately use the CWT uh, registry, and I think Carsten Bowman uh, highlighted that we could maybe add a row to this, uh, sorry, a column, a column to this uh, list and uh, uh, indicate what types here are for attestation, remote attestation purposes. No one else is in the queue. Yeah, I would agree that it seems awkward to have two separate registries here. And then like, is it illegal to use a claim from one registry and in, in another 
in if it's a CWT, then you and you use a rats claim. Is that is that like you know forbidden and vice versa? I I think as long as they're orthogonal, uh, it doesn't it, I don't think you run into any issues. Uh, the only time you'd have a problem is if if one one namespace tries to redefine the other another uh, something that's in the other namespace. Otherwise, it just adds it just gives the uh, developer some. Guidance in terms of what the semantics are for you. I guess I like various comments, you know, for or against separate registries. Or is it a sub registry? Let me be clear. I am advertising a sub registry. I am not advertising that you create a second CWT registry. I am saying that you're going to create a CWT claim, which says this is rats information. That is a sub registry, which is, is its own map. And you can go to town in that registry with whatever you want. They are separate namespaces and they are easily identifiable as separate namespaces. And, and the, sub, and it would, you can, and you can use any of the CWT namespace. Entries such as issuer expiration time that you want. And they would share share a registry or not? The rats claims section would be a sub registry. It would be a rats claims registry entry in the CWT registry. Therefore, the namespaces are separate. They are separate registries. I mean, it would okay. So they would be. It would really be a separate registry. Uh, for from uh, for uh, Iana. Yes. Okay. Um, this is Dave Thaler. Question for uh, Jim. I'm trying to understand your proposal. Um, if you have a, a rats claim with, uh, if I understand right, are you saying that there would be inside of a rats? Map there would be uh, claims inside there separate from claims outside of the rats claims in the same CWT. And if yes, then are you saying that inside the uh, rats set of claims that you could reuse non rat specific values of those who would be outside of that particular map? I'm just trying to understand your proposal and I'll have a follow up question based on the answer. Uh, the answer to the first question, I, I believe, is yes. The answer to the second question is. If you wanted, for example, to use the expiration time element, which comes as a standard CWT registry or CWT claim, you would use that expiration time claim outside. So the CWT claims would be expiration at foo at, at tomorrow rats map. Rats one claim, rats two claim, rats three claim. Okay, thank you for clarifying. So, in other words, what goes inside the rats claim would not be would only use things from the sub registry. Would not be able to use any of the values from the other registries. You'd never have both values mixed in the same map. That is correct. Okay, so then I think the challenge, and I'm not saying it's insurmountable, but I think it's a little bit um, uh, awkward, or at least people have to carefully write code and carefully write rules is um, if you have a set of things that are outside and a set of things that are inside, you have to carefully write the correlation rules between things that are inside and things that are outside to know, say, which rat specific piece goes with which um, uh, non rat specific piece in the claims. And so if they were in the same one, you could do an, a one type of nesting structure. If they're in two separate places, you have to do a different nesting structure. And I'm not saying it's not insurmountable. It's just more complicated than having one nesting structure. Can you give me an example? Uh, we've talked about cases where you have um, uh, multiple claim sets inside the same CWT. And some of those are cases where they're nested, where, you know, it, like in the layered attestation example that uh, Michael showed, you have one that references the second one that references the third one. Inside each claim set, there's both um, 
potentially standard ones and rat specific ones. And so trying to just show the nesting relationship between the first set, the second set, and the third set, I'm just saying it's tricky. It's absolutely doable. Um, you just have to do it more carefully. Don't believe it's any trickier than having it as a flat registry. So we have Hank, then uh, Thomas, Jono, then Carson Foreman. This is Hank. Uh, Dave took make an excellent job in making my point. So um, I, I basically uh, think it's more complicated, and we have to burden a lot of other documents with, compli uh, with, with, with uh, complexity. And yeah, that's it. Thanks. Thomas, are you in the queue or no? Karsten. Yeah, over in, in uh, Jebba, I just uh, created a simple example of how such a nested uh, CWT could look like. And uh, uh, I just copied that over to the uh, chat. And um, basically, fundamentally, th there is no difference uh, between having this nested namespace and putting it in into the top level CWT using some other namespace mechanism. You have to define the interactions between these claims in all cases. Um, so I, I don't think that, that actually nesting the thing is, is uh, creating additional problems. Uh, but we, we are still stuck with the original problem, which is uh, we have to to define all the interactions between claims uh, that that we think are interacting. So if my class frame two there in, in the example has some interaction with NBF, uh, we will have to define that interaction independent on whether it's represented as an asset structure or represented as a CWT claim at the same level as NB NBF. Okay, Lawrence. Um, I guess thanks for the comments. Um, I'll, I'll guess I'll think about it and make a proposal, or maybe two two proposals to choose between. I, I'm not sure which, which way to go yet. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like you should just try them, given the the guidance and suggestions you've been given, and. Those your results, or maybe you'll come out with one or two, a good proposal, or maybe two. Yeah. All right. Thank you for that. Okay, next up. Um, get this out of order. Um, I think next up was. The timing definitions, Eric. I have. Sorry, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm trying to find. There we go. All right, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the events that we've been talking about in the architecture meetings. I want to give thanks to Dave and to Lawrence for doing some help in scrubbing them, as well as Wei, who uh, talked about some of the architecture diagrams and the flow diagrams and some of the early threads. The basic concept of what we're trying to do here really builds off of, off of the use cases. We have use cases that are built out in, in, um, in the use case document, but we need ways of relating the use cases together, what makes them common. And the goal is to define event definitions which span these different use cases. And if um, we're able to define these event definitions, the hope is that by including the definitions in the architecture document, we have a language which can help us more formally frame characteristics between the use cases, such as when do you send a nonce or when do you drive and create results. And with that, we can build uh, call flows or timing diagrams, whatever you want to call them, which expose the similarities that we all know exist between the various use cases that are in the use case document. So in this um, meeting in, in my session, what I'm going to do is two things. I'm going to go through the nine event types, which uh, a number of us have seen as reusable across different use cases. 
Um, and uh, as I review those, you know, get your feedback on those nine. And I'm going to have an ask for you either on the call or in a subsequent email to say whether you have changes that you'd like to make to those nine uh, definitions. Beyond that, there is the possibility there are other common event definitions which we have not exposed yet. In some dialogues and in some other drafts, I've seen the hints that there might be some other timing uh, events which could be common across the architecture, but it'll be up to the members of this group to go ahead and um, do what it takes to assert that you have an event which you believe is common enough to go ahead and include in the overall set in the architecture document. Now, if it doesn't make the architecture document, that's fine because you can always define them in your specific use case documents or your specific technology documents. But if you really want them to be considered as uh, reusable events, the best place for them, of course, is the architecture document. So two asks, review the definitions and two, see if you have additional asks. I did just send out an email uh, that is a pretty much summarizes everything I just said and provides the event definitions to the alias. So if you're unable to expose the information right now that you want to, the best place is to do that on the alias using the thread that I, uh, I just started. All right, next slide. So what are the nine event types which are contained in the current architecture pull request, which Dave Thaler has posted? You can see a number of different things from the value generation when a claim was created to when you'd send a nonce to uh, everything to when you generate evidence and others. I mean, we could review these one by one on the call but again, the ultimate arbiter of rightness is going to be the document. So rather than read any of these, and since many of these were actually on the alias previously in earlier threads, perhaps there are people who have questions now on any of these nine. Um, I'll just leave it out there to see if anybody has any initial questions on some of these potential claims. And I see one from, from Dave. Um, I just wanted to uh, clarify one statement that you made. Um, there's actually 10 in the pull request. Um, the 10th one is not on this table, obviously. Um, and the justification for the 10th one is in the document. However, the caveat is that uh, the 10th one, uh, depending on the protocol, it might not actually be in a claim. And so it's certainly an event type. That's the uh, uh, requests, uh, sorry, the uh, attestation results are relayed. And so it doesn't list that in the pull request as being in a claim because it could be passed in the transport protocol or it could be in a claim depending on how you define the protocol. So that might be why it might not be the nine that, that might appear in the EAT document, for example, or you know, it claims it would be usable in EAT, for example, but it's certainly an event type that there's a security check that needs to be done that's explaining that pull request. All right, I think that's a good one for the alias. Initially, I think we had talked about evidence relayed and whether that was enough, but we can certainly go on the alias and discuss that one some more, whether it's the same, whether it's different. Again, we do have to do some, I don't call it generatization of these because some events are going to repeat, but uh, apologize for hitting the um, nine instead of 10. If I missed it, then uh, I just missed it from earlier threads. Hank is in the queue. Uh, again, Dave beat me to it. <laughs> Dang it. So, uh, yeah, I uh, have nothing to add here except the comment that, yeah, that I think this should be at least informative guidance in the um, in the architecture to have consistent different references here. All right. Makes sense. Again, the, it, it'll be up to you guys to determine whether the definitions are right. And I expect a question from Hank in a couple slides. But these are not all the possible timings. We're really just trying to nail down the commonly used timings or the most commonly used timings. All right, next slide. As you're gonna see in this slide and the next one, as well as what Lawrence is going to do in a few minutes, there are people who have taken the timings, uh, the event timings and placed them into a 
um, into a flow diagram, which allows you to see how events uh, would play out for various drafts. This particular flow uh, matches to draft Fedorko, when, which is doing a remote integrity verification uh, solution. And what this includes is the idea that we have on the top left, the creation of a, um, a claim effectively in placing the claim in this case into a TPM or it's generated within the TPM actually by other values being inserted into the TPM. A random number coming from a relying party, which drives the generation of evidence, which is then pushed to the relying party, which then can go ahead and verify that evidence in order for the result to be generated and returned back down to the attestation result received, where it is then appraised by the relying party. So this is an example flow. And of course, the relying party then will only have to have the values uh, acceptable for a certain amount of time. This is the way the information is uh, supposed to be used. And um, I do expect to work with Guy and have text that shows this as, a, as an appendix, appendix in his uh, excellent document um, in order to, to show, again, uh, a way to allow this use case and the timings between them to be correlated between different, different drafts. Next slide. All right, what this slide does is it shows uh, something I'm gonna talk a little bit later uh, in the session when I get to, to my individual draft. This is a, the generation of composite evidence within the attester. In this flow, we have again, the same way we started the last flow, uh, the generation of a uh, claim within a TPM and the extraction of the set of claims from the TPM with evidence generation and evidence one being passed up to a verifier. At that point, we go ahead and send attestation results back down to the attester, uh, but then we start another, um, another attestation process. Verifier B has a new nonce, and that nonce is identified with uh, NS prime, and that's how we're thinking we should identify the reuse of event types in a diagram. You pass event two across, and then uh, various composite elements within the attester take the original attestation result uh, and mobile evidence from EG and EG prime to send the result over to the verifier, and the verifier B then looks at that information and will do its own assessment uh, of the evidence, appraisal of the evidence, in order to take a result and uh, then allow the uh, result to expire. So this is, is at least one proof point that many of the event times that we were just talking about are event times which, again, are common across different use cases. Lawrence will have more in a second, and I see a question from Dave. Um, yeah, my question is actually on the previous slide. All right, um, we can jump back. Okay, um, so here I was just comparing this diagram to the one that's currently in the pull request, and I had an observation on this diagram, and I think there's a couple things that are either missing from this, or perhaps you need something other than the non-space background check. And so in particular, if you look at the bottom half, um, you see time Rx is on the bottom, Back in the table, Rx was defined by the verifier. And so unless you have synchronized clocks, that time Rx is not known by the relying party in any comparable way. And so you need nonce checks over there between the relying party and the verifier that's not shown here. Although this is only showing the nonce check between the attester and the relying party. So what that means is that this diagram is not showing how the relying party knows that the attestation results are no longer fresh. You need more than what's on the slide in order to determine that. Agreed. Basically, the question for any diagram is how much do you expose in the diagram and how much do you expose in the underlying text with the diagram? And at least for this version, I was trying to simplify uh, the event times rather than talk about the deriving uh, and the carriage of some of those times within the other elements. So the diagram is a, is a tool. The definitions are eventually going to be have to be included in a combination of the of the diagrams and the document itself. 
So if people want a uh, to see a longer example, they can look in the pull request, which does have uh, a, a non-spaced background check that has more than what's on here. It has other extra stuff on the bottom right side um, with the explanation of it. And so if people want to see that, feel free to compare, If point out if they find any issues in the pull request, let me know. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the fun things that this does is if you go back to the very first thread that we put together on this, there are a lot of discussions on how many nonces are sent, when are they sent, are they shown or not shown. The tool of these diagrams is quite effective in exposing things which people take for granted. For example, some people want a separate verifier to send a separate nonce to the relying party in order to gather the evidence. Is that required? Well, maybe not if the verifier is able to look at the attestation results and they don't care that the, the verifier doesn't have to care. Uh, they don't care if the verifier's assessment went when it happened. So these kind of diagrams show the variance in the types of processes which people are using, all of which are valid based on which entity that you might own. And so these are, are again, uh, showing that there is a language constructed which allows us to make a lot deeper comparisons between what we're doing from our use cases that would have been otherwise apparent. All right, back to the next slide and a uh, question for Hank. Thanks, thank you. Yeah, so um, um, this is uh, because at the end, there's always this attestation results no longer fresh. So we're talking about freshness here, apparently because nonsense also. And I think that is an extra reference frame here for talking about freshness versus recentness, which we are planning to uh, um, add to the architecture, I think. And uh, so this is, would be another good reason because this, this um, types of uh, points in time uh, are basically relevant for the freshness recentness discussion. I think Dave can add to that. Okay, Dave. Yeah, the section nine on freshness in the document already does contain a brief discussion of the difference between recency and freshness, although I don't remember who uses those terms, but the concept it completely explains, but it doesn't go through the examples. And so that's what we're talking about adding is the examples. Uh, and uh, for everybody else that hasn't looked at the pull request necessarily, the, all the examples and stuff will be in an appendix that's then referred to from the, from the freshness section. Because uh, it just adds in uh, learning and has references to things that might be used in, you know, each or whatever else. And so, uh, but the short version is in there in like a two paragraph form. Again, so we have a toolkit. Uh, this is a toolkit which is only as good as our definitions of times and the way we decide to construct the diagrams. So, any other questions before I jump to the last point on the overall? structure and purpose of both the event times and the way to expose them in the sequence diagrams. Eric, you're actually over time, but I'll give you a couple more minutes. <laughs> this should just take a second uh, for the last slide. Next slide. Last slide. Um, I wanted to highlight in purple that there are other event types which I've heard in discussions. Um, one that uh, came from TUDA is, do we want to have a centralized nonce or handle distribution across multiple devices or it's a possibility? So the last ask I have for you is if you have other times that you want to include in the architecture document, now is the time to propose them. I don't have a need for these times, uh, but others do. And I didn't want to hide the potential times which I've heard in previous discussions so this is just a, uh, a kind of like a, a mind uh, reminder to say, you want this time? If so, you're gonna have to argue with them. And, and that's it. That's it for me. All right. I can give time if there's one question, but I don't see anybody in the queue. So we can uh, switch over and continue on the timing. Uh, Lawrence, mm -hmm. you're up next. Yep. Okay. Next slide. So what I'm doing here is taking. Oh, that's the old slides. I sent a revision. You did. Uh huh. When? Yesterday, probably around noon. 
Because after I saw Eric's uh, new diagrams, I redid the presentation in a substantial way. Wayne's characteristics. That was sent before that. Okay, my bad. In the interest Project of time. What's that? Maybe he can project his own. There we go. I'll upload these while you're talking. Okay, thanks. Sorry about the confusion. Um, so what what uh, I looked at Eric's diagrams and tried to think about how the different uh, time events would fit into eat uh, and whether whether they fit or and how they fit. Um, uh, you know, whether EAT was covering all of those things to just to understand if um, EAT was complete in this way to, to be able to handle all this. And the answer is may, maybe not, it needed some work. Um, so um, I'm going to go through uh, about four, four or five slides here to talking about each of these uh, time different uh, times and how they should manifest in EAT. First, as an evidence, and then secondly, as in uh, attestation results. So, um, this first time, time uh, VG or value generation, I believe that was time A in the old diagram. Um, uh, so, th there's the idea that a, a data item might be generated uh, at some time long before attestation is you know, in the picture. Um, long before announce was received, uh, maybe even outside of the attestation, uh, outside of the attester. Um, and so that, that time, that data might be uh, long precede the attestation. So um, the example here I'm giving here is a GPS uh, position location requirement uh, that happens um, in the GPS subsystem you know, you know, maybe the, the GPS subsystem is monitoring position and then you go into a basement and you don't get a GPS anymore. Um, and, uh, the, and the GPS is, uh, subsystem is recording the times at which it, um, you know, last knew a good location. So that's all done outside of attestation. So now this comes into uh, a uh, into the tester, you're generating a claim. How do you deal with that? So, um, one approach could be that every possible claim that we can define can have a timestamp associated with it. Um, I'm saying I don't think we should do that because I don't think most claims are of this nature. Many claims are, but not most. So, the proposal here is that each claim that has the possibility of being cached or generated uh, in, at a time uh, before the, the token is being created, before the evidence is being created, should have uh, fields or data items as part of it to indicate um, when it was generated. Um, so individual claims have to be modified. So um, I'm giving an example here for the location claim where I have a, uh, a timestamp, uh, which is an absolute time and an age, which is uh, just the number of seconds on how old it is. And you, and you use one or the other, but not both. Can you take a question? Uh, sure. Uh, so this is Stephen. So I, I have a question here that I don't know the answer to, and this actually harkens back to that discussion we were having about guidance for people defining new claims, uh, because we probably want some guidance in there too. And the question is, um, do we think that it will always be the case that somebody defining a new claim will know whether a timestamp would make sense for it or not? Is that because it seems to me that there's an assumption in your proposal that that's already known, and maybe that's true. I, I can't tell whether. I haven't decided whether I think it's true or not. So I'm asking, do you think that's true that you'll always know when creating a claim whether it needs a timestamp or not? I, I, otherwise, um, if for some reason you know, that means you either need to define things twice, which I don't like, or you'd have to have a way of having uh, a more generic mechanism, like having some wrapper where you can have the claim and other metadata claims about it inside the same map, for example. 
Yeah, good question. Do they know? Um, I was kind of assuming they probably would. Um, and I'm also was trying to help uh, maybe avoid some complexity in that in in uh, trying to you know come up with some sort of a general uh, mechanism to uh, be able to timestamp any claim. So uh, this is uh, Ned. Uh, one of the ways to think about this is that policies can decide or determine what the requirements for whether or not a a, a timing or timestamp is is needed. The challenge is is coordinating that the policy re requirement with the a tester who's doing the collection to know that they're trying to meet that policy. And I don't think that's a topic that's been discussed. Um, I, I mean, you have to have uh, data structures or data items to you know to be able to have policy. So I just was trying to think about the data items first, and then. Sure, lots of policy can have do lots of stuff with different things, but and as you can see from the CDDL, there the timestamp and the HR are optional, so policy could reject if you're you know if it's missing. But just the question is, can you? Um, you know, do we do we try for some sort of a general? Uh, I think my point is is that there's two there's potentially two entities at play here. One is the policy owner who's who's setting requirements for what they expect and then there's the attester or the implementer of the attester who's trying to satisfy that policy and uh, uh, unless there is some uh, mechanism for coordinating those requirements maybe it's captured in in a in a protocol somewhere or maybe it's captured in a requirements document somewhere uh, or maybe it's uh, you know just tribal knowledge Somehow that those the, the, that those two entities have to agree on on what their what the requirements are and how to satisfy them. Okay. So, I mean, I think Dave's question about the, the do they know is that's probably a really key question. Uh, I went through the claims that are defined in. Um, eat today and uh, seemed like most of them it was clear um, and most of them were pretty pretty clear that you you would pick them up right away there wouldn't be any caching or you know older values for them uh, so that's one of the reasons I went this way um, I think it would be good for everybody to, to think about this maybe I'll I'll post an email to uh, uh, ask for uh, uh, if they would know, um, the, the other uh, claim uh, that we haven't got in yet is anything to do with measurement. Clearly, measurement would uh, would matter, um, especially with something like um, runtime integrity check. The the that really uh, the age of that or the time stop that really matters. Uh, Dave Taylor has a follow up question. Yeah, I'm thinking that uh, timestamp is not the only type of uh, claim about a claim, I mean, a claim about another claim that we have. I mean, we had discussions, I don't remember what it's called, but I'm sure you remember that the notion of, you know, how is it connected? Is it, you know, uh, on chip or on bus or something else? Is a claim about a claim or whatever? Um, and so what it's in the uh, Jabber chat room, I put an example of a way that we could do it if we do it generically. And again, I haven't decided yet whether we need to or not, but I think it's doable and it's extensible. And I suspect we will find other reasons why we might want to do something like that too. Or you define a a, a uh, claim that's a map of other claims that contains one claim and then the set of metadata about that claim. Um, so I just point people to the chat room if they want that idea. Again, I don't know if it's something we have to do, but I think that as we go through other types of Claims about claims. I think timestamp was just one of an example of multiple. Okay. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so some devices have clocks, and uh, some devices have uh, don't, and some devices have clocks, and their clocks are unset uh, sometimes. So to deal with that. The idea is to have two different uh, uh, 
ways to represent here. You know, one is a timestamp that just you know standard uh, seaboard tag one epoch time. Um, that's preferred. You know, if your clock is set, uh, use that, and that's that's all that's all good. Um, if your clock is not set, um, it seems that there's value um, in an age claim. Um, you know, to be able to do an age claim, you have to have a ticker, something that measures elapsed time. Um, so, like uptime uh, ticker, like you know, Linux uh, works. Um, uh, then it's up to the verifier to kind of take a look at it, and the verifier has these two times, uh, eg or vg. Uh, I think I got that wrong. I think I should be that should be nonce generation. Oh no, I'm sorry. It's the elapsed time. So the the age is the elapsed time between value generation and the uh, token generation, e.g. Um, and then the verifier can compute that, uh, get to an absolute time by uh, you know, pinning it in between the, the nonce generation time and the, re the receipt time. Um, I believe it makes no sense to uh, have a, you know, if we, well, that's actually the next slide, but um, uh, so, so, Anyway, the, the, the timestamp and the age, that was the, the idea between, between the timestamp time stamp and the age. Um, there was an age claim in uh, um, EAT. Oh, I removed it because uh, it didn't, it was, it was, that was really more of a claim about a claim. It was just sitting there as a, as a top level claim, but I think you're, you know, Dave's characteristic is a, as a claim about a claim. I think that's, so, um, uh, any comments about age versus timestamp? So I just inserted myself into the queue into the WebEx. So, um, the uh, timestamp is clear. What I'm undecided about is whether an age claim by itself is, uh, or you know, meta claim, if you will, or you know, like time stamp, so a claim about another claim, uh, whether that by itself is the right way to express things. That's certainly one possibility. Um, another possibility is um, where you only have, uh, say, deltas between particular events. So I'm just going to make something up because I can't pick something on the slide here that's relevant. Um, so let's just pretend that the time EG minus VG um, was interesting on the left here in the tester. I think it was in some in one of the other diagrams, but not in the one that's on the screen. Um, and so let's say the evidence needed to include, maybe it is in this one, it, it, the evidence needed to include a time, needed to include information that let the relying party determine time EG minus time VG, right? So one way to encode that would be to have uh, two different claims, one that is age VG and one that is age of EG, and have the relying party do the subtraction. Another way to do it is to have one claim that's just the delta that the attester puts in. Okay. Between those two approaches, um, the second one is obviously more compact because there's only one claim instead of two. So what I'm undecided about is whether there's enough use cases for having age of VG and age of EG be appearing in there twice. That might be possible, and that would align with the example that we talked about with timestamp, where you know you had to collect some metadata about each claim. And so I can see advantage of both of those, um, but I don't know which one is better, which is the question that you're asking. Yeah. So uh, let me do two more slides and then get to Hank and um, uh, you come in on what you you have to say because I think the the uh, this slide and the next will will uh, have some use for it. But don't go don't go next yet. I just want to. Uh, so on this uh, this here um, on the nonce the the. You know, in Eric's timing diagram, the, the, the time of the nonce is noted, um, but I don't think there's any reason to put it in the uh, attestation evidence or the attestation results. So there's no field for recording the time of the nonce. And I think some, some other, a couple other times are of that character. Okay, go to the next slide. Um, so, so uh, time EG, um, that, that's the time of uh, token creation or evidence creation. Um, the proposal is to use the uh, issued at time from CWT. It seems like it fits uh, correctly there. Um, uh, this is the time all the claims are formatted and the signature is applied. 
Um, I didn't see any reason to uh, be more fine grained than that, like say, well, this is the time we collected this claim and this is the time we signed it and this is the time we sent it. It just seemed like it's all kind of happens pretty quickly and there, there wouldn't be any reason to, to be more fine grained than that. So it's, there's just the one time issued at just, just like a CWT and a JWT have. Um, this time is always uh, an absolute time. It's never an age. Um, and basically, if the clock has no, if the device has no clock or the clock is unset, then you just leave this claim off, and the ver verifier has to go uh, by the um, uh, you know constraint of it's either you know it's after NS and before ER. Okay, so now uh, Hank, go for your question, and and Dave maybe then answer some comments for. Uh, from what you were saying. Well, hi, I think, um, with respect to Tudor, uh, the unidirectional time-based stuff, so it's not using the, the non nonce conveyance uh, method or one of them. Um, ties relative time always cryptographically to absolute time that is trusted um, to uh, mitigating that step. So in, in, in Tudor, for example, this age semantic is not captured in evidence, but in a separate protocol specific channel, which is the synchronization message, which uh, 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 guarantees a, uh, a trusted uh, closeness of the uh, uh, relative to absolute time association. Um, and uh, that is uh, therefore not a claim per se, but a protocol header item, which you could say. Um, it, it always depends on how you work this. So uh, defining the claim in itself, I think is, is useful. H is a little bit, well, it's, it's three letters, that's nice, <laughs> but it's a little bit generic. Uh, so you have to really always have to read the text. It's not so intuitive like issue that, you know? So uh, uh, may, maybe there's a better name for that, but uh, that's, that's tiny nits. I think in general, this is a good way to approach this. But I want to have, it's not necessarily claim. In Tudor, you always have a clock that's set, right? Uh, we have, sorry, we have two clocks, uh, the relative clock and the uh, real-time clock on the system. And then we have a external source that you can reference, uh, you can get the token from. That is a handshake. And, uh, and then uh, have a trusted reference for time. Um, so, and this, uh, unfortunately, clocks are not very uh, accurate. The accuracy of clocks varies. So they have uh, jitter and they uh, uh, are um, drifting. And uh, therefore, you have to resync and set new points of time where you uh, start this first relationship of synchronization again. Actually, it's three clocks. If you talk, uh, talk about the external clock also. Okay, I, I was going to say that um, in Tuda, you would always know what time it is, so you would never use the age claim. You would all use the timestamp claim for for, uh, for a VG. Uh, yeah, but the relative time is a tick. You have no idea when this tick is. You have to couple it to real time. Without real time, the tick is not meaningless to the outside world. I'm not sure I'm following that, but I mean, to me, it's the it's the verifier and the relying party that really want to know um, when the value was generated in an absolute sense. So, trying to get to that. Um, yeah, and in Twitter, you, you create evidence, but it only includes text. So you have to couple it to a, a trusted uh, real world time in order to make the relative useful in the global scale. And I thought you were talking about ticks somewhere and said that age is ticks and therefore relative. So that's why I was picking up on that. Yeah, but um, the idea is that somehow to take the, the tick count in the age and turn it into an absolute time because that's what the, the verifier and the relying predator are after in the end. Yeah, just just yeah. I think it is not easy to have that done in a trustworthy manner without an external trusted time source. The real time clock is not a, so, a secure source of time and GPS can be spoofed and such. Okay. All right, well, I'll look at the two stuff and see how I, I think it fits in, but I, I guess you're not really proposing any change here. Um, Dave? Uh, do you have does this answer some of your questions or do you have some comment on this? Um, I don't have any further comment. Uh, I, I, I haven't 
changed what my original question was. So um, uh, I am still wondering. I mean, right now I'd be inclined to say, sure, go ahead and define an age uh, claim uh, in, in a, but I don't know if there's a strict need for it, but I don't have any objection to adding it. As I mentioned before that uh, on the last point about should you have the ability to group metadata about claims? I said timestamp was just the first one of a set, and it could be that age is another one. Yeah. And how strong you apply your trust in the actual value itself might be a third one, and so on. So, okay, I'm fine going on. I, I haven't changed what my question is or where my head is at, but uh, um, I, I guess right now I'm slightly leaning towards having a generic meta claim mechanism rather than having timestamps or ages or whatever else stuck into the claims itself as the other proposal was. Okay. Um, I mean, one of the things when I think about those, those kinds of things, um, it's just code size and complexity. Um, typically, relying party and verifiers don't have code size with issues, but um, sometimes if, if you're trying to do verification on the device, then that would have some size of publication okay uh next slide all right so um results creation um so I, i'm assuming uh that oh, attestation results can be uh, in each format um the uh, CWTG and JWT have a uh, expiration time. They also have a not before time, but I, I don't know if that's useful here, but they, they already have an expiration time. So the idea is to use that. Um, then it would, it, uh, it, it seems obvious at first that the issued at claim can be used to record the results generation time. Uh, that that all, that fits nicely, um, except begs the question now: How do you carry both a the EG time and the RG time in the attestation results? Um, I'm assuming the relying party will want to know that um, they can't both be the IAT claim because uh, you can't have duplicated claims because of the uh, duplicate keys and maps rules in Cbor. Um, you could redefine the claim to be an array of of uh, things, but uh, to achieve that, if you wanted to, um, so uh, it seems like there's um, two options that I could think of. One is that you start including the full attestation evidence as a subpart of the attestation result. So that would be an interesting change to eat to allow that. Um, eat generally hasn't been. Not too much work has been done on it for it to carry attestation results. Um, another would be to define a results issued at claim so that they can coexist. Maybe there's others, but this I think this opens an interesting question uh, about formats of attestation results. I didn't have an, anything other than uh, these two proposals. I don't have a, you know an answer yet. I might lean towards a here putting all of attestation evidence in the attestation result um, because uh, verifiers and relying parties, especially with big data and um, machine learning, all that they they live off of data. So the more data, the better. So comments or questions on that, Dave? Um, so this is Dave. I certainly wouldn't want a to be mandatory for say TEEP, for example. So I don't think that that's necessarily, uh, I think that would be something that would be up to a particular profile or use case or protocol to define, but I certainly don't think it should be mandatory for all of them. Um, in other words, especially if you have, say, a relying party who's a constrained device, shipping them a whole bunch of evidence that they don't want doesn't actually help the constrained device. Um, so that's why I would argue against A for being a, a inherent part, although I have no problem with A in a particular profile, for example, if somebody wants to do that. Um, the other question that I was going to ask is, um, you said that you thought that the relying party might want to know time EG, and I am not sure I understand why that is. I could perhaps understand if a particular claim in there 
is passed uh, the, from the evidence and copied back in the attestation result that they might want to know time VG, the time that that value was generated. But uh, when it was when that particular value was composed into some larger set, I don't know why the relying party would care. And so that the onus would be on the person proposing that to say, why would the relying party ever care about time EG inside of an attestation result? I could certainly buy the time VG in the attestation result, but EG, I don't get that. Okay, EG is, uh, in a way, it's the it's the VG for all the things that were not cached in any form. But um, yeah, good to think about. Okay. But it's really whether the values appear in the attestation result, and certainly there should be many cases, uh, use cases for which the attestation result is uh, lean and mean. You know, the verifier vouches that the evidence looked good. The end. You just trust the verifier. If you're a tiny constrained device, that may be exactly what you want because you don't have the code size to do any other checks. Then does it come up with a verifier that I trust? Right. And so keeping that to be small is great. Uh, having other complexity is in there. If a profile wants it, um, just don't make it be mandatory. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, that was all the slides I had. I don't know if there's any comments or any more comments or questions, but. Thank you. All right. Up next is back to Eric. Hello. Now, uh, initially, the slides I put together were for the interim. That's why it shows reps interim, but it's actually the virtual rather than interim. Uh, this is talking about a use case, which uh, is a new one that was introduced at the interim. And the use case is one that depends on things like draft Fedorka and has implications to other drafts like the draft pub sub. So I thought it would be good to give a high level overview of the draft as well as the current questions that are open. I don't have any asks right now other than consider the context and consider some of the things I'm going to point out about composite evidence, uh, which I'm going to be describing in a few seconds, because I know I don't have a lot of time for this. So next slide. Now, there is a use case uh, that's interesting for finance, military, government, medical types of uh, users where you want to make sure that traffic in a network flows only on devices that are recently uh, attested and their attestation results come back as that they are trusted. The goal here is to have sensitive flows bypass devices which are not currently verified to be secured. Um, there's many types of tests that we could try to attest. Uh, it could be as, I don't want to say as basic, but as uh, straightforward as checking the boot integrity of devices. It could become a lot more complex as well. So the basic use case is a trustworthy pass through the network. Next slide. There are two ways to do this. We could get attestation through the background check model, much as Draft Fedorko talks about by having the attestation information passed up to the verifier in something I'm calling an attestation event stream, which I'll chat about more in a second. And with the information being streamed from each of the devices, you can go ahead and push a path to get to the target uh, resource at the either end of the network to make sure you choose a trustworthy path. Next slide. The other option is one that is about composite evidence. In this case, you get your information from the attestation event stream up to the verifier. And at the attestation, uh, in processing the attestation event stream, you then send attestation results back down to the router. When the link comes up or periodically with protocols like 802.1x or MACSEC, you can go ahead and do a new quote from your um, from your attester, include that information returned from the verifier, and at 
each peer device decide if your peer device is currently trustworthy. Details on how to do this are in the draft. If it is currently trustworthy, you then add the links to your peer as part of a layer three uh, topology, which again allows you to construct and change dynamically paths through the network uh, for trusted topologies. Next slide. There are three major elements uh, that are interesting here. The first one is an attestation event stream, which builds on the Yang model that's already been adopted by the work group, as well as some subscription work over in the um, NetConf working group. And we take notifications that include evidence and pass them up to the verifier. And uh, this is uh, a link to the, the Yang models um, that allow pretty much real-time information be pushed up to an attester and processed. So that's the first main element of the draft. Next slide. Second main element of the draft is something that we haven't talked much about yet in the, in the group, but I think it's going to become a big thing over time. And that is identification of levels of trustworthiness or even levels of, of results that are passed down to a device. For example, uh, do we need things that are claims that identify whether the device is compromised, if it's unverified, if it's boot verified? At some point, we're going to have to have definitions of some results which might or might not be reusable across drafts. And again, I'm not asking for any answers yet on this draft. It's just showing that this discussion is one I expect the working group will pick up at some point. And then the last slide. In the last slide, this really just goes back to the timing diagrams that I showed in my last presentation to show that as part of the uh, timing of the flows, we're going to be passing composite evidence uh, at various times between various devices. And again, this is just showing the importance of composite evidence and the ability to take multiple things at an attester and be able to send them to a relying party and verifier to go ahead and process things. We don't assume necessarily that the verifier is the source of all information. Uh, verifier A is the source of all information which needs to be verified. So this is mostly information for the three. Uh, any questions? Yeah, Eric, this is Dave. Uh, just sure. uh, in the specific case, um, in the composite evidence, is there in your, the cases that you're using, is the composite evidence itself need to be signed, or is it really just a collection of uh, individual pieces of evidence that can be put in the same transport? B. Each individual piece of evidence is signed. B. Okay, so then we don't need any way necessarily to have composite evidence be, you know, a, inside of the each, right? This is just a set of each that are all passed in the same transport. Uh, well, it wouldn't necessarily be each in this case because we have another format Sorry. with the TPM, but uh, yes, there is yeah, I one. Misspoke. Yeah. Yeah, there is the, one uh, thing that is worth highlighting. We have to, if you look at the composite evidence, you're going to see that there is a signature that is included in one bit of evidence to another. One thing that you have to consider is the timing of these things have to be bound together. So you do have some binding between these claims and including information. For example, the at step one, the signature of the information from the attester in the results that are sent back in step two. So there is a binding where some of the evidence will be included in other signatures to prove um, providence and timing. Okay, thanks. All right, so that's it for me. Okay, so you're asking people to review this document, Eric? Absolutely, review, especially uh, start thinking about where different levels of trustworthiness are being encoded, as well as the importance of composite evidence and the fact that uh, some people have talked about passports or passport models. At this point, this is a combination of a passport model uh, and the background check model, but I was initially using the word passport for what is being sent across. Uh, I do think that the, the word passport has to be used very, very carefully 
as uh, I, I certainly am not willing to have the word passport be used only for unmodified information uh, going between devices. Okay. So a request has been made to review and comment on the draft. Please. And we'll take it up on the list. All right. Um, next we have Way. We have yeah. a question on the queue, Lawrence. Oh, sorry, I missed that. Lawrence, you had a question. Lawrence, you're on mute. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> if you're calling something a passport, it should be signed. It should be stick to an, the analogy of a real passport, which means it's it's something that's been probably been signed by some somebody like a verifier and that the the holder of the passport doesn't modify it so i think um you're moving away from the the term passport towards composite evidence is probably that seems in line with that uh, for a, a way to look at another way um when you take your passport to another country they stamp it with their own effectively oh, that's true yeah signed evidence <laughs> And therefore, it is modified and updated and is a living document. Oh, okay. All right. So, yeah, in that way, yes. But so there's different parts of the passport that have different characteristics. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So, so now we need a blockchain, right? Well, hopefully not. But the, <laughs> but the, the ideas are important to see that the passport has to have some living, breathing elements to it, just like a real passport does. Because that, that, that living aspect of it, I don't think that's in the, in the architecture document. Definitely. That's why I'm highlighting here is that we have to make there's an, actually the word passport is not used in the architecture document, only the passport model. Okay. And that's why I brought it up is that we just don't want to use the word passport unless the definition allows both stamped and unstamped things. Okay. Thanks. It's worth noting that the the thing the, the structure that we would call the passport, which is the attestation results, is included in the composite evidence unchanged. It's just augmented with these other signatures, which which I think are the equivalent of the stamping. Exactly. I'm wondering if that shouldn't also be captured in the architecture draft, because I didn't see anything to that effect in the latest version. That's why I brought it up as composite evidence. We had early discussions. I would love to identify. But actually, if you put the word passport in, I think it has to be identified. Right now, the architecture document doesn't include the word passport. It only includes passport models. So I think it should be included. Um, and my only requirement, if it is concluded, is that these models are supported. I think there may be an open question around how prescriptive the architecture would be, given that it also the architecture also supports hybrid models for which complicated to try and give each hybrid a name of of uh you know, give it a name all right we obviously need more discussion for that in the architecture too then okay let's move on um way wait huh yes it, can you hear me yes Um, yes, uh, I'd like to introduce our, um, not a new, but uh, still, I think it's new draft netcom using netcom PubSub models for rats interaction procedure. Uh, we, uh, we presented it at the last meeting, but, and we have uh, updated uh, this time, but uh, it's not a big update. So uh, here is a, uh, I think it's a brief introduction also to our um, to our uh, thoughts of this draft how to how to go on on uh, how to go on the further work on this draft slide please uh, first is a quick rec recall of the uh, the draft uh, what we want to do we want to use the net pump pop sub mechanism uh in brief it's uh it can be sh is shown in the picture that the attester uh receives the uh, the verifier sub subscribe uh to the uh to um invite 
and the testers will record the happened events uh, and then publish the event record to the verifier. So it's uh, different from the uh, traditional uh, challenger response interaction model. It's, uh, uh, it's different and uh, it's suitable uh, for the use cases where you want to use on-chain uh, remote attestation. And they, when you in, when you use it in a larger uh, work, it may, will be more flexible. And uh, uh, Eric's draft also described to use this mechanism. So I think it's also a suitable use case uh, for routers. <laughs> and uh, the benefits are obviously inherited from the young pops up and young push mechanism and uh, like flexibility, efficiency, et cetera. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, after some discussion, and uh, we have some uh, key points for our document. Uh, first is the scope of uh, uh, this document. We want to uh, define the, uh, use uh, the suitable new, uh, young models uh, for the TPM based network devices like routers and uh, based on the draft uh, T uh, REST young TPM Chara. And uh, uh, ba based on this uh, scope, we will uh, define further define uh, detailed models, uh, including the event streams and the subscription, like uh, all this kind of stuff. And uh, uh, we have planned. Uh, some we have planned a detailed young model and we are uh, preparing preparing our new update uh, soon and uh, in the new draft in the new version we will detail uh, describe the how to solve the freshness problem uh, mostly we you, we will use the time based mechanism such as the CUDA draft and uh, also uh, use announce and uh, periodical notification to solve the freshness problem. And uh, some of this has already been written in Eric's draft and uh, we will, uh, that's a good, uh, next please. Um, you have a question from Dave Taylor, I think. Okay. okay. Hey, this is Dave. Um, I'm gonna ask the same question that we talked about last IETF, but I didn't see the answer in the document yet. And so this is a reminder to cover the stuff in the document, which is in your sequencing diagram, um, the first line was that the verifier doesn't subscribe with the attester. And the original question was, how does the verifier know when to subscribe, right? The attester may or may not be up at the time. It may be in the middle of the rebooting. So how does it decide when and who to subscribe to? I don't think that's covered right now. And I think to have to tie that to a particular use case or something to say, how would you know? Because that's really, you can't use this until after you've answered that. And so you need to cover that first. The, the step zero, as I called it in the, in the first email. Uh, and uh, um, in my feelings, I, I kind of think that's a part of implementation Part. And but I will consider that, and uh, further I will uh, address that I uh, as much as I can, and in the draft, and uh, discuss with you later. And uh, thank you for your question. Mark Voigt has a question. Yeah, I have one follow up to that to consider. Um, um, one of the things about the Yang subscription drafts is that they depend on transport. If your router reboots or something goes away and comes back. The subscription is recreated, so the underlying transport uh, will solve part of the problem that you're describing, Dave, um, and then that, that could be included in the document as well. So look at the transport drafts and some of the replay mechanisms. They do have tools for solving this. Yeah, Eric, and if I remember right, that particular transport, because like I said, we had this discussion at the uh, hackathon at the last physical IETF where I at least Frank and I, and I remember who else was part of that discussion, but I don't think it's in the document. It says when you when the attester reboots, um, if it has a cache subscription, then it proactively reaches out to the verifier, um, as opposed to the verifier reaching out to the attester. And that's not shown in the sequence diagram. But that's what my recollection is from memory. I could be wrong, but it's not in the do document right now. So that's all I'm saying is please add that to document. 
There's a nice little Easter egg in the RFC 8639, knowing this was gonna be coming. When you do subscribe to a device, it will give you the event since reboot that are relevant for that device. Right, but if the a tester doesn't proactively reach out to the verifier on a reboot, right, which is what I think, Eric, you were saying does happen in a transport, right? If it didn't do that, then it couldn't talk to a relying party that relied on, say, a new attestation result until after it waited around for the uh, for the verifier to reach out to the attester. Absolutely. Okay, way, way, I think okay. you can continue. Yep. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, it's the last slide, and uh, we will take the draft based on the discussion we have before and define more details. And uh, we will, uh, we, are, we, uh, we will welcome more deep uh, reviews and comments. And uh, uh, that's all. Okay, thank you. All right, with that, I think we've completed the agenda. Any other comments or questions? We we are. So let me just do a reminder for those. Um, I do see um, most everybody signed up on the blue sheets or or Tom, thank you for, for adding them. It would be good for Colin user four and Colin user eight to identify themselves on the blue sheet. Um, would be great. Um, they, they probably can't see the blue sheet, so maybe they could just tell us who they are. Uh, good idea. Oh, I see Colin user eight dropped off. Who's Colin user four? Maybe Andrew S. I would assume it's a person that has only dialed in and has not done anything else. Yeah, that's why I'm the Andrew Sullivan. Yeah, they probably don't even know their caller user for. Andrew, are you calling user four? I, I well, we commented in the WebEx chat. I think I am. Okay. Uh, okay. We we could ask for anyone that's just dialed in with through the audio bridge, not through the the full feature rich kind of WebEx client or through WebRTC to, to check or to do a roll call. I don't know what you mean by that, Roman. You want me to do a roll call? No, no. So so I think the outliers are the calling users. So if you if you participated in the in the working group meeting by just calling a phone bridge or a SIP bridge and did uh -huh. not use the WebEx kind of client, if you speak now, we can make sure that you're in the blue sheet because everyone else we know because they're they're listed in the in the participant list by name. So we did catch the Colin user four. Colin user eight isn't on anymore. Okay, well then we're done. Next time. Okay, so um, just a reminder, our next virtual meeting will be on April 28th at 7 a.m. Pacific time. And I forget what time that is in UTC, but we'll send a reminder um, before the session. With that, Unless there are any other comments, we can close the meeting. Going once, going twice. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Nancy. Okay, bye.